So copyright for online college, what you need to know. Uh, like I said, my name is Jennifer Kelly, a copyright librarian. And today we're going to be covering um, a definition of copyright um, and what it means in a college, like the College of DuPage, what it means to you as a student or a um, member of the community or a teacher staff member here. We're going to talk about some of the exceptions to copyright law that allow us to use copyright protected materials when we're here on campus and in our classes. And some of those exceptions include um, some things you might have heard of, like public domain, fair use, licenses, permissions, things like that. Okay, And at any time, feel free to ask questions. Um, just go ahead and type those in the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye on that. And it looks like we still have some, some people joining us. So I'll make sure that I, I cover everything I need to about um, anyone who needs to get credit, again, at the end of the session. So bear with me. OK. So let's move along here. This slide, of course, says you are a copyright owner. What do you guys think about that? How, raise your hand if you are a copyright owner. And if, you got, if your faculty and staff have got an email today, um, you already have the advantage because you know the answer to this. Well, six people raising their hands. That's a pretty good start. Seven, six. Oh, someone's not so sure. <laughs> Up back up to seven. There we go. Anybody else? You don't know? OK, and that is fine. Um, you are all copyright owners. I guarantee it. If you have ever taken a photograph, if you have ever written an email, if you have ever written a paper and handed it in in a class, either within the last year or the last 20 years, you are a copyright owner. Copyright covers, there you go, yes, raise your hand now, because <laughs> yes, you are a copyright owner. Um, copyright protects um, creative work, creative original works, as soon as they are fixed and tangible. So what that means is, um, creative, and that's a very low threshold. An example of a non-creative work is a phone book, because it's just a list of names. But um, something like an email that I sent, the text message, the messages that you guys are putting in the chat box right now, those are, you have the copyright in those. Um, it's very simple. Because they're original, they came from you, and as soon as you type them, they are fixed, which means that they exist not just in your head, not just as words that you just set out in the world. They are fixed, they are creative, they are original works, and you own the copyright in them. You don't need to register in order to get copyright, and you do not need to put the symbol, the copyright symbol, on anything in order for it to be copyrighted, uh, which is good to know because lots of times we'll be looking for images or texts or something that we can use in our class or a presentation, and you won't see that little copyright symbol, but that does not mean that it's not protected. Most of what you find out on the internet, images, video, music, is protected by copyright, whether it says it or not. We are going to talk about some of the exceptions to that and some of the things that will make it a little bit easier for you to know what you can use freely and what maybe you shouldn't use freely. Sound good? Everybody proud of being a copyright owner now? <laughs> you can walk away. If nothing else, you can walk away and be like, yeah, after that session, I, I'm a copyright owner. I, exactly. It's, it's time to celebrate. <laughs> so what is copyright? And as a copyright owner, what kind of perks do you get? So here's the thing. Copyright is granted by the United States Copyright Act. And it grants ex what they call exclusive rights to creators, which means that nobody else has the right to do the following with something that you've created. Nobody else can make copies, so the right to reproduce is entirely yours. You can't make photocopies. You can't print off a new run of things. Um, the right to prepare derivative works, which means stuff that's based off of what you've created. So for example, adapting a novel into a movie is a derivative work. No one, if you write a novel, no one can turn it into a movie without your permission. The right to distribute copies, you sharing music files online, for example, the only person who has the right to do that is the copyright owner. 
could be the publisher, it could be the um, artist. That's why lots of people have gotten in trouble with the RIAA for illegally sharing music, because they don't have the right to do that um, unless they own the copyright the right to perform copyrighted work publicly. And that's not just a performance, like putting on a show, a play, or a dance. Um, it's also showing a movie, um, and whether or not you can do that with or without permission. Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but if you've ever looked at the opening screens of a DVD or rented a DVD from the College of DuPage, you'll see that it says for home use only. And that home use only means that you're really only supposed to watch that DVD with a small group of your friends and or family, um, and that completely excludes things like showing a movie at a club meeting, or could also get in the way of something like a film festival. And finally, the right to display a copyrighted work. Um, this includes putting on a play for an audience, hanging up a piece of art, um, showing a, a reproduction, um, like a photograph of art, that, that kind of thing. So, um, so the right to reproduce, the right to prepare derivative works, the right to distribute copies, the right to perform, and the right to display are um, owned solely by the person who has the copyright in that creative work. So if that's the case, how is it that you can make copies of a published story and share them in class? How do, you, how do movies based on books get made? Um, why can you download a song from a website for free? And is it illegal then for COD Club to host a film festival? And why are there so many Shakespeare productions out there? <laughs> so some of these are the questions we're going to answer um, when we talk about um, exceptions to these rights. Okay? So let me know if you, again, if you if you have any questions about what we're talking about here, or if you want to take a guess at any of the answers for these things. So first we're going to talk about public domain. And this answers a little bit of the question about why pretty much any school you have, you've ever been to, from grade school through college, someone has put on a Shakespeare play, or Alice in Wonderland at Know, little kids are doing it all the time, why there's so many different versions of the movies and adaptations and cartoons. Um, these works, Shakespeare, Alice in Wonderland, lots of older things that you come across, are in the public domain. That means there's absolutely no copyright attached to them. The person who created them has no rights over them anymore, which means that those five things that only the creator can do, you can do whatever you want with them now. So we've got Shakespeare's plays. You can perform them. You can take the text and put it online. You can take the text and adapt it and make it into something completely different, change the names of all the characters. You can do a modern day version of Hamlet. Um, you can do whatever you want with these works, uh, again, because there's no copyright. So that's one reason something would be in the public domain, uh, that the copyright is expired, just because it's, it's just plain old old. Uh, copyright lasts for a while in the United States. It is the life of the author plus 70 years. So if somebody is very, very talented, and this counts for not just for works of fiction or, or um, written works, but art, art as well. So say you're a child prodigy and you create an amazing work of art or write an amazing book at the age of five, and you live until you're 100, that piece of work that you created as a child prodigy is not going to enter into the public domain until 70 years after you've died. So if you wrote it, at, you know, created it at the age of five, you live until you're 100, 95 plus 70, before anybody can do anything with that work. So this is why you see a lot of old stuff over and over again, because it's free, and anyone can do what they want with it. Um, and that's another reason something would go into the public domain is that it, um, it was never protected by copyright in the first place. So um, as I mentioned, there are, um, oh, sorry, a question, Rosalind. Yes, some copyrights are renewed. And that's absolutely, you can renew copyright. And so things can last even longer in uh, protected by copyright. And, and it's, it's kind of problematic. And we'll talk a little bit about that now, like what the benefits of of things falling out of copyright are. Um, and yes, you can buy copyright, absolutely. 
you can give up your copyright. So let's say I write something and I want it to be in the public domain. I want no copyright involved in that at all. I can leave my copyrights to someone in my will. I can sell my copyright to somebody. Absolutely. And this is why we call it intellectual property, because it's a lot like property. It's like um, you buy a house and you can sell it, you can give it away, you can open it up and let cats live there, <laughs> you can um, you do a lot of things with it, and the same thing with, with your creative works, absolutely. And copyright can, uh, can make you some money in that way. Uh, let's see, oh, so works that aren't protected. So there are some, some things, I mentioned that um, a work has to be a creative original work. Um, and fixed in order for it to be protected by copyright. So if something is not creative, like a list, like telephone book, um, then it would never be created by, I mean, protected by copyright. If it's not original, then it can't be protected. So for example, um, an adaptation of Shakespeare, for example, might not would not be protected. Um, and then finally, what else was I going to say? Oh, um, you, you, works by the United States government for the most part, are not protected by copyright. So you can use those freely as well. And there is the Copyright Office. Um, there's the Copyright Office is located in the Library of Congress. And the Librarian of Congress is actually the Chief Copyright Officer. For patent and trademarks, it's the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So that's the USPTO. Oops, spelled that wrong. <laughs> USPTO, there you go. So those are the reasons why something would fall into the public domain. It expires. It was never in the public domain to be, I mean, it was never in the copy, copyright protected to begin with, or it's been donated to the public domain. And so it means that, what that means to you as a student is that you have the freedom to do some stuff with this. So here's a question for you guys. Um, as a final project, let's say a student, group of students films a modern day version of The Wizard of Oz. Can they fill, share that video on YouTube? Or, or maybe and, can they show it in the Mac and charge admission? What do you guys think? Just type your ideas into the, uh, into the chat box there for me. And something we're going to discover in um, the course of the next few minutes. 45 minutes that we have left is that uh, there are no easy answers in copyright, unfortunately. It's really hard to say uh, yes, absolutely, or no, absolutely. A lot is yes, but, or no, but it depends. <laughs> OK, we've got a yes, we've got some no, we've got all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> I'll let some people finish up. Yes, strong yeses, um, some not quite so sure, and it's okay to not be sure. So Wizard of Oz, the book, is in the public domain, absolutely. So you can do what you like with it. Um, one of the problems with the, uh, there's a new movie that came out last year, the year before, the, um, the great Oz, the great and powerful. Um, they were able to do that because the book and all the information in the book is, is public domain, so they can take the characters and they can take scenarios. Uh, but what they couldn't take were things that were created by the original, by the first movie. So the book does not have any mention of ruby slippers. They're not ruby in the book. And so in this new adaptation, they couldn't use that because the movie is still protected by copyright. So that makes it a little tricky. So our students, they can film a modern day version of The Wizard of Oz, no problem at all, as long as what they're creating is based on the book that is in the public domain. Okay, so if they've got Dorothy in um, you know, ruby red slippers and maybe that gingham dress or some other little elements that are unique to the movie or singing over the rainbow, <laughs> then they might run into some problems. So let's say that it's, um, they don't have any of those problems entirely based just on the book. They've never even seen the movie. Um, can they show it in the Mac in charge admission? And the answer to that is, yeah, absolutely. There's no reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, go for it. Why not? <laughs> they want to make money off of it. They can. Absolutely, they can. They could package it as a DVD and sell it. They could do whatever they like with it, because it is in the public domain. OK. 
I'm hoping that you guys will still be able to hear me okay, because I'm in my office with a skylight, and I can't even hear myself right now. So let me know if it becomes difficult to hear me, or if you can hear the rain pouring down. It's kind of like being in a tin can. OK, so our next slide, our next exception to copyright are classroom exceptions. So this is the reason why, great, you can hear me, thank you. And you can hear the rain clearly, too. <laughs> Just imagine me doing the webinar outside, getting soaking wet. <laughs> OK, so classroom exceptions are the reason why a teacher, or a student for that matter, can make photocopies of something and distribute them in class. Um, it's the reason why in your class, if your teacher decides they don't, she or he or she doesn't want to teach, you can just watch Finding Nemo that day. Um, that's the kind of thing I think happens a lot more in, in grade school than in college, hopefully. Um, but there are exemption, exceptions to copyright for the classroom. But it's important to remember that these exceptions are, have some qualifications. And those qualifications are, it has to be in a classroom or similar learning environment. It has to be in person, face to face. These same exceptions do not apply to online classes. There are completely different rules for online learning. Um, and third, it has to be at a non-for-profit educational institution. So you've got your, let's say, um, biology 1100 class. And you're on a field trip. And your instructor sets up, I don't know, a projection screen to show you a movie. You're no longer at the educational institution. It might be because it's a, a museum, maybe. But say you're outdoors in the parking lot, <laughs> and your teacher, for some reason, shows you a movie. You're no longer in the educational institution. You're no longer in a classroom. Um, you are face to face. But the, all three of these things have to be in place in order for these exemptions to, to apply. But if you meet all three of those, then you are you're just made. You can do pretty you can perform or display pretty much any work at all. You can put on a play in class, you can sing an opera in class, you can watch an opera in class, the entire thing. You can watch Finding Nemo, you can listen to the entire new Ed Sheeran album if you want. Uh, there's no limit to what you can do in that case in the classroom. But it is important to remember um, that it does not apply for online classes or class activities outside of the classroom. So this is all extra extracurriculars, even if they're co-curriculars. Um, the three conditions are, and I can uh, type this in as well. So it has to be in a classroom, has to be face to face, and it has to be at a non-profit educational institution. Okay, so for-profit colleges and universities have different rules for this, um, and they they don't have the exact same exemptions. They probably have to pay for a lot more permission and licenses than public institutions do. COD is an NFP, absolutely. Yep. And so when they say classroom, that also includes you know labs like the Mac would count um, the. SRC 2000, the big conference room, things like that. You know, our, um, you know, the horticulture greenhouse. Those would count as as classrooms. So, all right, let's get on to our next scenario here. So, our scenario is Professor A finds an excellent article in today's newspaper and wants to share it with her class. Can she make 25 photocopies and hand them out to her students? Oh, and I spelled the word can wrong in the next thing. And the next question would be, can she scan the article and post it to Blackboard? So she, maybe she's teaching an online section and a face-to-face -face section of the same class. Yes and no. <laughs> These are some, some tricky issues. Got some yeses. Yes and no. We had a split decision. No, no. And feel free to type in like your reasoning behind this too, especially if you're not sure, like what might be um, be throwing you one way or the other. Yeah, it's not face to face for the second one. Okay. Not on Blackboard, maybe. Oh, well, we'll start with the first one. You can make 25 um, copies 
and hand them out to her students. And yes, and this is the weird thing. So Rosalind makes a good point. So um, one of the issues with copyright is that you don't want stuff freely distributed, right? So you've got an article, you photocopy, you give it to your students. Because you're in the class, that's OK. But the students, yeah, the students could be going out with those stories and making copies and distributing them further. But because it happened in a classroom, face to face in a non, um, non for profit educational institution, that's OK. But if you do the same thing, scan it, and post it to Blackboard, you might have some issues. In this case, this is a little tricky, and I probably should have worded this a little bit different. But say if the newspaper comes out today, that's fine. Scan it, post it to Blackboard. Blackboard is acceptable because it's closed and limited just to your students. Um, and so that's actually better than if the same teacher scanned the article and emailed it to her students or scan the article and put it up on um, you know, her personal web page or a blog or something like that. So it's a little tricky, a little, some gray areas here, but uh, that's, that's sort of the way that works. So and I'll be, yesterday I did a workshop specifically for teaching for copyright in online classes, and we'll probably be doing that again through the TLC. So for those of you who are uh, faculty and staff, um, we can do that too. And you can also um, give me a, an email and I can send you the recording to that if you're interested as well. You can email me that. Um, if you give a login and password to cloud location, that would be, that would be acceptable as well. Um, maybe not as good as, as Blackboard, but yes, that idea that it's, on, that it's just limited to your students is, is kind of key. And that's part of the, um, I'll type this in here, that is an aspect of the Teach Act which I'm not going to get into too much today. OK. So another exception to copyright law and the exclusive rights that copyright owners have is, um, are licenses. And this is basically, I own something. You want to use it. I say you can use it as long as you pay me or follow some other kind of stipulation. So generally, to make derivative works, that one, um, that one exclusive right for, cop for copyright owners that we talked about. Um, so that would be movies based on books, books based on movies, coffee mugs with famous images on them, action figures like these guys here. Someone needs permission, and that permission is usually in the form of a license. The copyright owner allows the other person to do this very specific adaptation, usually for a price. Um, earlier, let's see, where did that come up? Somebody asked about Sean. Sean mentioned about, um, that you can buy copyright. And there are licenses are kind of similar. So you have exclusive licenses and non-exclusive licenses. So an exclusive license is Lego has a deal with Marvel Comics, allowing them to be the only company in the entire planet that can make Avengers action figures that are like this, the sort of minifigs. Um, that's an exclusive license. Um, maybe Marvel gave the exclusive license to whichever production house, movie um, production house, created the movie. No one else can make that movie. But if you have something like maybe Avengers betting for kids, there might be a few different people who can do that. So that's a non-exclusive license. So it's not just limited to one person. One person doesn't have the exclusive right to make Avengers bed sheets for kids, other people do. So it's a, it's a little confusing, but you pay the copyright owner in order to do a specific thing with that copyrighted work. We, in the library, license a lot of materials for you, which makes things easier for you, because we've already done the work, right? So things in our databases, whether they're articles, let me draw on this page here a little bit for you get my pen. So articles in our general databases from magazines, newspapers, journals, these have been licensed for educational use. Uh, ebooks, images, newspapers, online videos, all of those things have been made available for you to use. Um, the licenses can be very specific about what you can and cannot do with them. 
And occasionally licenses, which are a form of contract, can trump copyright law. So there could be something in a license, and if we sign off on it, that says you can't make copies of this chapter from an ebook, even if it's for your class, then you can't make copies from that ebook, even if it's for your class. So um, that's something to keep in mind. But do know that material in the library's databases are there for you to use in your classes, for your research, whatever your educational use is. Take advantage of that, because you can't say the same thing about materials that you might find out online. Um, when you find it from the, in a database, you know you can put it in your class. You know that you can use, incorporate it into your final project or your presentation. That goes for images, it goes for music, it goes for video. We have all of this streaming media in the databases. Can copies of the articles on databases be copied? Yes, to a limited extent. Sort of like our last question that we had. Um, so say you are um, you're teaching a class or you're doing a presentation in class and you want everybody to read a specific article. You find it in the database. It's available as a PDF. It's available as HTML. You can copy it. You can email it. You can print it out. Generally, what you want to do, whether you're teaching or you're a student and you're sharing, is you want to share the permanent URL to that material. So it's frequently called a permalink or a oops, permanent URL or a document link. And this will always bring someone back to that particular piece. This is what we generally recommend instead of copying that PDF and sharing it in Blackboard. Because what you're doing is the difference between copying and oops, sharing a location. So you can completely always, almost always, I'm not going to say always ever. Uh, you, you can generally avoid copyright infringement by sharing a link with something. If, for example, you're using an image or um, a video or streaming audio, frequently the databases will provide you with embed code that you can copy and put into your Blackboard course or into your presentation that will allow you to use that. Um, and that's freely allowed as well. But if you're doing a little right click or you're doing a screen cap and editing it, then chances are you're kind of uh, you're going outside of the scope of what might be allowed there. So codlrc.org slash databases, use them. We've bought them for you using your money, of course, but <laughs> which means you should be you should feel required to use them even more because you're paying for them and they're great resources here for you. Another type of license is Creative Commons. Can I get a show of hands for anybody who has ever heard of Creative Commons or used Creative Commons works? Got a couple of hands showing up. Not too many of you. OK. Creative Commons, like I said, is a type of license. It is a layer on top of existing copyright. It's not a replacement for copyright. What it does is say I take a picture. It's a beautiful picture, fantastic picture. I share it online. It's so popular. People keep asking me, oh, can I use it for this? Can I use it for that? I just want to be, you know, you can use it as long as you say where you got it from. Just say this picture came from Jennifer Kelly. You're good. You can go. Instead of having to answer every single person who wants to use my image and tell them that, I can attach this license to it, which gives them permission to use my work so long as they abide by the specific license. So you'll see there's six licenses here, um, and then two public domain tags, which aren't necessarily licenses, but we'll talk about those a little bit too. So Creative Commons um, it gives you a lot of freedom and flexibility. So if you find something with this license or if you create something and attach a license to it, ranging from really, really open to all you have to do is give attribution, say where you got it from, who created it, all the way to a little bit more um, constricted, which is attribution, not for profit, and no derivatives. And that is uh, this one here, which means you have to say who it came from, 
you can only use it for non-commercial purposes and you can't do anything else with it. So you can't edit it, you can't change it, you can't remix it. Um, so say if it's music, you can't remix it. If it's a video, you can't splice it or edit it and do what you want with it. But if it's this one, you can do whatever you want with that as long as you say where it came from, which is a lot of freedom. And the whole point of Creative Commons is, is this here, allowing users, so I just crossed half of it out, allowing users to re distribute, so share, remix, tweak, and build upon other works. So that's your derivatives as well. Um, so you're allowed to share, perform, um, publicize, all of those things that are usually exclusive to the copyright owner. The Creative Commons allows those owners to um, provide a little bit more freedom there. You can find Creative Commons licensed materials using this tool. This is something Creative Commons puts together, and I'm going to put this in the chat box for you, so you can follow the link. It is search.creativecommons.org. I use this tool so much for pretty, actually for this presentation, um, any image that isn't a screen capture is from, um, I found using Creative Commons. You can find media, images, web sources, music, video, and it will be Creative Commons licensed. You'll see here that you can um, limit to certain types. So these, by clicking these, you're a little bit more restricted by what you get. You're saying that you're going to use it for commercial purposes or that you want to adapt it. Uncheck those if you're using it for educational purposes. There's no reason to restrict those. So undo that, put in your search term. You'll find images that you can use, do whatever you want with. Um, Fantastic. I, I really, really like doing this. And so you can, of course, go right into Flickr. You can go right into Google Images. You can go right into uh, Wikimedia Commons and search by license. But this makes it so much easier. So I use this a lot, mostly for images. But for you can use it for a lot of other things, too. So jot that one down, because it is super useful. And nine times out of ten, all you have to do is give image credit. OK, another type of exception is when you have permission. And of course, licensing is a type of permission. But I want to talk a little bit about um, what permission means. So I think I alluded to this at the beginning, um, home videos for home viewing only. So here in the library, we have a lot of feature films. And they're very popular. We let folks rent those or borrow them Excuse me, for a week at a time, completely for free. The expectation is that you're bringing that video home and watching it on your computer, on your DVD player, with friends, with family. Um, we are expecting you not to be hosting your own film festival <laughs> um, in your backyard that's open to every, anybody. Um, we expect that you're not borrowing these movies and showing them in a club setting, um, even if that is on campus. And the legal definition of this, um, this home viewing is limited. I think I couldn't find the exact wording, but it was, it's really pretty specific. It's a limited number of friends and family. So you are expected to know the people pretty well who are watching this movie with you. Um, when, so what you can't do with movies from the library is, um, like I said, share them, you know, play them in a club, which is something you'd think you'd be able to do. Say the paralegal club wants to watch um, a John Grisham movie. They need to get permission in order to do that, because it's not in a face-to-face -face class in a non-for-profit institution. It could be in a classroom, and it could be face-to-face, -face, and it could be here on campus, but it's not part of the class. So that's a, a, a funny little technical thing. Lots of um, videos we will get with public performance rights, which means that you it's built in. That's that license. That's the permission given ahead of time for us to show this to a large group. It could be something for a new student orientation, or it could be something for training um, or the like. But 
you do need that permission in advance. So it never hurts to ask. I've learned that over and over again, especially really um, for educational purposes. If there's something you want to use from a publisher or a movie or music or image, contact the person who is who owns the copyright and ask, say, hey, I'm doing this documentary for a class. Is it OK if I use your image? Many, many times they'll say, absolutely. They will act, they will definitely, they will give you permission. Uh, they might ask for money. It's possible. In that case, if you are a teacher here at COD, let us know in the library because we have money for that. We can help you make that happen. Um, if you aren't sure who to contact, let us know. We can help you with that as well. Um, and as far as, as tracking people down or, or figuring out who to contact, that's something that the library can help anybody with. So it doesn't hurt to ask. And it's better to ask than to get a DMCA takedown notice or cease and desist letter <laughs> or something like that. So it's, it's good to get permission. And it's, in my experience, it hasn't, hasn't been particularly challenging in most cases. The only time I think you're going to get some, um, some difficulty is if you're work, trying to work actually with an educational publisher because they'll, they'll not want to give stuff away for free because their whole point is to create things for educational purposes. And so they'll have it. Um, they'll have a price structure in mind. Uh, OK, if you're using it in a classroom as faculty here, you're pretty much covered, yes. Face to face here on campus in your class, limited to the students who are enrolled in your class. So you can't just open that up and say, oh, yeah, we're going to be watching this great movie. Bring your friends. Bring some popcorn. Uh, so that's, that's another limitation there. OK, we've got another scenario for you. Instructor B requires students to watch The Empire Strikes Back outside of class time, but it is required for the class. Can a group of students check out the library's copy and watch it in a group study room? Alternatively, can the instructor reserve a room on campus and have an open screening of the movie? So I'm going to call this one A and this one B. So that way you can say A, yes, A, no, or whatever. I like my handwriting here. Oh, we've got a no, yes, a yes, no, a no, no, yes, no, yes, no. Another yes, no, a yes, no. A no, yes. Here we go. Let's see. A, yes, B, yes, because rooms reserved teacher should know who's attending. It's good to see some, some, uh, justification there. Uh, if the, yeah, there you go. We have to ask some questions here. Is the um, movie, does the movie have public performance rights? It's a good question. Oh, someone can't see the descriptions. I'm so sorry. The first one is, um, can a group of students check out the library's copy? And the other one is, oops, here we go. Oh, gosh, I just got rid of the whole thing. Hold on a second, sorry. There we go. OK, so first one, can a group of students check it out in the library's copy and watch in a group study room? Technically, no. Technically, the answer to that is no. We are, and this is sort of assuming a few things. The first one is assuming that the group of students um, are not friends and family. They're just a group of students. It could be friends because they're in class together. So that's one thing that counts against them. The second thing, and this is a finicky little thing that the library has to deal with, is that if you are watching a DVD in a place where other people can see the DVD, that is technically a public performance. I think that's just the craziest thing in the world. But So our group study rooms <laughs> are, have glass walls, and so it would be a terrible viewing experience, but because somebody else could be standing in the hallway watching the movie, that's public performance. And that even counts, and this is why we have locks on our DVD players, and also why, I mean, on our DVDs, 
but also why it says for home use only on all of our DVDs, is that students technically can't check out a movie and then watch it on the computers here in the library. Because again, that is considered a public performance. And it is. It is kind of ridiculous, Sean. I agree. Um, but that's that's uh, that's the law for you, right? <laughs> uh, so the second one, can the instructor reserve a room on campus and have an open screening of the movie? Um, again, no. So this is assuming that the, the room is being reserved outside of normal class time. Um, if it were normal class time and it's the class you were normally in didn't have a projector and it was just your students, that's fine. Um, but if this is saying an open screening, um, and so that would be open to other people, so they would not be able to do that. Yeah, so it's open to the class. And this is this is an interesting one. Um, so it's open to the class, but it's not during class time. That's going to depend. Again, that's going to depend. So there's some tricky stuff there. And what I what I have always have to remind everyone though is that you know the FBI has never shown up here on campus and told somebody to eject a DVD player because somebody might be. You know, eject a DVD because somebody might be watching it over their shoulder, or you know, shut down a class because there's there's one person in the room who's not a registered student. So um, these are very literal laws, and uh, but there are of course wiggle rooms. Not that I'm endorsing that you that you do any wiggling, but um, there there are of course always going to be times when you just you don't get all overly concerned about whether your door is going to get knocked down. Um, the next thing, this is this is a tricky one, I think, for a lot of people to get their head around, is um, the difference between plagiarizing, plagiarism and infringement. So it is possible to um, avoid plagiarism by giving attribution, but still infringe on copyright. In the classroom, generally, if you're giving attribution, so say you're doing a multimedia presentation, a student is doing a, a PowerPoint presentation in class, and they have some images or charts, and of course, the student is required to cite where they're getting that information, right? And all of you students would do that in your proper APA or MLA format and say where you got it from. Doing a speech, you do your oral citation. Um, everyone's smiling and nodding, right? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Uh, so that's attribution, and that's fine. Uh, but just because you're saying where it came from doesn't mean you have permission to use it, right? So you. Um, you write a paper for your class, and it has some images in it that, because uh, you're talking about art, perhaps, and you've got some nice little little images that you pulled off of Google, which is fine because you say where you got them. That's perfectly OK for your classroom. But say your paper is really great, and your instructor says, you should publish this. Although you say where you got your images from, once you're outside of that educational arena, and you're making something available outside of the classroom, uh, you you could be infringing on copyright. So you do need to get permission when you're not using that material for in the class. Does that make sense? I kind of had a long, involved story to, to discuss that. But I think a lot of people think, and this happens a lot in blogs, you'll see someone just you grab a picture that you find on the internet and say, you know, image credit, whoever it belongs to, and put a link on it. And I'm OK. I'm all set. I said who it was from um, lots of times in YouTube videos. And raise your hand if you've seen this before, um, clips from movies or entire movies and saying, you know, all rights reserved. And you know, I'm not claiming that this is my own. It's OK. I've, uh, I'm saying who it belongs to. Exactly. Um, you know, here's the entire movie of you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey. But I'm not saying it's mine. All you're doing is saying that you're not plagiarizing. Um, you are still infringing on copyright. Again, it doesn't cause as much problem in a classroom, but once you're outside of the classroom, once you're sharing things online, especially if, if uh, any of you are using blogs or wikis or Twitter or anything like that, Instagram, it's available freely out there for the world to see, um, that's when you can run into some, some problems. And you'll notice that some of my slides in the bottom right-hand corner um, do say image credit 
and the person who it belongs to, um, but these are Creative Commons licensed materials. And this is an educational setting, but it's not face-to-face, -face, so uh, some things I need to consider as well. So here's our scenario for this one. A group of students create a multimedia project using and citing images and video clips that they found using the library's databases. So are the students infringing copyright if they don't also get permission? And does the audience make a difference if the audience is just students in the class, or if they're presenting at a conference, or if they put that up on a public blog? What do you guys think of that? And thank you all for thinking about all this stuff, because it's, it's, it's not easy. And I really appreciate <laughs> you guys working it all out and asking questions and considering all the options. And that I've gained participants instead of lost them while talking about copyright law is very, um, very exciting for me, because I love this stuff. I think it's fascinating. OK, what do we have here? We've got some no, yes, no, yes, 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 no. Does the work give a place to get permission? Very good question. It's OK if it's in the context of a classroom. Anyone else they're infringing? We've got a no and a yes. Great. OK. So um, throwing in the information about the library's databases was a little bit of a red herring. Um, so they're creating a multimedia project. They've got it. The stuff in the database, they at least know that it's, um, that it's licensed for educational use, right? So um, if they are citing their sources, they are not infringing copyright. They do not need permission for a multimedia project that they're submitting in the class, that their instructors and maybe their classmates are going to see. The audience is going to make a difference. Classroom, you're OK. At a conference, Probably OK. Citing your sources is probably enough. Um, you want to make sure that the stuff that you're getting is legal. And this is, I should have mentioned this earlier, too. So say, like earlier, I was talking about how if you're in the face-to-face -face classroom, non-for-profit education, teaching um, your students, you can perform anything, you can watch anything, but those things have to be legal. So you can't you know, go to the new X-Men movie and sit in the back row with your camera and then show that to your class and think that that's OK <laughs> because you've already broken a law and so copyright's not in your favor. You can't illegally download music and share it with your class. Um, but legally obtained things are, are OK. So assuming everything then in the multimedia project is, is legally obtained, you're probably OK at a conference, too. Once you go public, once you go outside of that, educational arena, then, then there's questions that have to be answered and probably permission. Permission needs to be granted at that point. A fantastic resource that I highly recommend is called movieclips.com. Has anybody heard of this? I love it. I don't use it that often, but I think it's the best thing. So as these a couple people have, yeah. Um, it is a couple of, I think, college kids, maybe. Maybe they were just out of college when they came up with it. Um, were you know frustrated to see how many movie clips and things would show up on YouTube that were illegal. They'd end up getting taken down. You couldn't rely on them being there. Um, some of them were really really lousy quality. And so these two guys worked with the studios to make clips available for free and 100% legally. The most awesome thing about this website is that not only can you find these clips, but you can search by so many different things. You can search by the name of the movie, the actor, the director, the genre. Makes sense. But you can also search by prop. So if you're looking for movie clips that have cats in them <laughs> or um, wine bottles, you can do that. You can search by action, so punching, sleeping, falling down. You can search by mood and by theme. It's a really, really neat website. And if you are putting together a multimedia presentation, you are teaching something in a class, whether it's film related or not, you want to talk about theme, you want to talk about genres, this is a super easy way to get free, legally available um, movie clips from popular movies going you know, historic all the way through present day stuff. It's a fantastic resource. 
They allow you to create uh, playlists. You can embed them in a website or Blackboard, either because they're already freely legally available, so it doesn't matter whether it's behind a, um, a login like Blackboard. Put it on your blog. Why not? It's good stuff. So definitely take a look at that. I, I have a lot of fun on that page. And that wraps up what you need to know about copyright in college, that you are both creators and consumers of content. And so by respecting copyright law, you are encouraging other people to respect your copyright rights as well. OK. Hopefully that all made sense. And if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. I am going to give you my email address. Edu. Yes, and you can have a copy of this PowerPoint. Just email me, and I'll, um, I'll share that with you. And I also want to point you to, in case anybody is even half as interested in copyright as I am, which I don't know if there's, there's anybody here who is, uh, I'm going to share with you the library's copyright resource page. Give me just a second here hard time typing and talking at the same time. OK, there's that. Um, address clips on YouTube. Oh, YouTube is a good question. So YouTube, um, yes, you can always share links to videos on YouTube. Um, if embedding is available, you can do that as well. Put those in Blackboard. But again, you do want to make sure that those clips are legally available. Um, not necessarily because you're going to get in trouble, but how embarrassing would it be to say to your students, I want you to watch this movie, here's the URL, and then you know a week later that movie has been taken down for copyright violation. And the students are like, what movie? There's nothing there. So you want to really, really make sure that the stuff you're using from YouTube is um, posted by people who have the right to post it. And that's, um, that's something that isn't always clear. But if the username is a bunch of random letters smashed together <laughs> instead of the name of a movie studio, um, that might be a good, a good hint. Or if something that just came out on DVD is available in its entirety on um, YouTube, then that is also a good chance that it is not legally shared. Um, in a power presentation and show, so including a YouTube video, yes, you can embed, um, embed video if the embed code is available in YouTube. Or if you're, you're doing, say you're doing a PowerPoint presentation in front of an audience um, and you want to put in a link that opens up YouTube in another window, absolutely. And you can always, always, always use links. Um, it's very rare that, that sharing a link is, is infringing on copyright. Any other questions? So please um, use my email address if you are if you require um, your instructor to be notified that you were attending, um, email me your instructor's name, um, the class name, and number. Um, Sean, make sure you email me. Um, I'm not going to be able to do it right from Blackboard. So make sure you send me that information in an email, OK? And uh, yeah, that's it. So that's what I need from you guys. And then I'll contact your instructor. And you will get credit. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for, uh, for participating and for joining me today. I had a lot of fun. I like talking about copyright. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> if you have any questions um, about this presentation or about copyright in general, feel free to get in touch. I'm really happy to talk about it. Um, and uh, thank you. And have a great afternoon. I'll be here for another couple of minutes. Um, I'm just going to turn off my mic, so if you have any questions, feel free to type those in. Otherwise, 